On Monday an earthquake struck Indonesia's West Java, sparking a series of massive landslides which killed more than 270 people, with at least 40 more still missing under the mud, rubble and debris. Just a day later, 5,000 kilometers away, the Solomon Islands were hit by two quakes, the first at a massive 7. Zero magnitude, which damaged buildings, brought down the roof of Australia's High Commission in the nation's capital Honiara and sparked initial tsunami fears. Watch the video, two earthquakes strike in Australia's region. Greater than greater than that came just hours after a magnitude 3.2 quake struck popular NSW tourist hotspot Batemans Bay, only a month after a similar event rocked the small town of Mansfield in Victoria. On November 22 alone, the U.S. Geological Survey recorded 19 seismic events among Australia's island neighbours. The majority were aftershocks on the still-shaking Solomons but also included a 5.0 magnitude quake south of Fiji and another 4.7 magnitude event off Indonesia. So exactly what is happening with what would appear to be a spate of earthquakes rocking our region right now, and why is Indonesia's 5.6 magnitude event having such tragic consequences while a much more stronger event days later off the Solomons is still yet to record a single casualty, and why has Australia, itself a massive island, largely escaped the tectonic trauma so frequently rocking its neighbours such as Indonesia and New Zealand, the ring of fire to understand what causes quakes and volcanoes, we would first need to look at the tectonic plates, the massive, irregularly shaped slabs of rock which largely make up the Earth's crust. These plates, according to CNN, are moved constantly above the mantle, a layer of solid and molten rock below the Earth's crust, by the massive amounts of heat stored in the planet's interior. Now, island nations such as the Solomons, Indonesia, New Zealand and Vanuatu are situated on the west and southwest section of what's called the Ring of Fire, a 40,000 km arc stretching from the edge of the Pacific Plate to smaller tectonic plates such as the Philippine Sea Plate, to other plates that line the edge of the Pacific Ocean. The tectonic plates boundary goes around New Zealand, Fiji, the Solomon Islands all the way up to Japan through to the west coast of the US and down to South America, Geoscience Australia senior duty seismologist Taja Pejik said. All of that is the Pacific Ring of Fire, it has earned that name because 90% of the world's seismicity is happening there along the various plates edges. It's also home to 75% of Earth's active volcanoes, including Tonga's Hunga Tonga Hunga Haapai volcano which produced the largest recorded eruption in January this year. Those volcanoes along the ring are often formed when one plate is shoved under another into the mantle through a process called subduction. And it also means large earthquakes, which can risk triggering tsunamis, occur in these subduction zones shallow and strong it's this setting on the ring which has particularly deadly consequences for Indonesia, which because of its location regularly records stronger offshore earthquakes. Despite Monday's quake reaching just 5.6 on the Richter scale, its relatively shallow depth and its positioning on shore, right under West Java, is what caused such devastation, according to Seismology Research Center Chief Scientist Adam Pascal. Usually for Indonesia they're offshore and deep, he told 7 News. Com.au, this one was 10 kilometers deep so people were just on top of it. In fact, Monday's Indonesian quake was roughly similar to the deadliest earthquake to strike Australia, killing 13 people when it hit Newcastle on December 28, 1989. It was along those lines with the same depth, Pascal said, in Australia we have quakes at usually 2 km to 20 km in, depth, range. Pejic backed up the comparison, what happened in Newcastle and in Java is comparable. She explained the border of the tectonic plate called the Sunda Plate runs along a large sea trench south of Sumatra and Java for a couple of thousands of kilometers and was constantly going off, in seismic terms. 
located further along the Seine Trench, named the Sunda Trench, was the epicenter of the nine. One quake that led to 2004's devastating Boxing Day tsunami, magnitude 5 quakes along that trench are very common, Pejic said. What's uncommon but not unusual is a shallow earthquake north of that trench like what happened to West Java. It was onshore, it was shallow and the epicenter was near populated areas. The Solomon Islands quake on Tuesday was much stronger, measuring at 7. Zero magnitude and just 15 kilometers deep and followed by another 6.0 quake just 30 minutes later. In the Solomon Islands it was strong and shallow. Normally those are quite deep, Pascal said. However, the damage, which included the roof of Australia's High Commission and similar damage at Honiara International Airport, was fairly minimal compared with West Java, where landslides triggered by Monday's event took the death toll to 271 and left at least one village buried. This would be largely due to the Solomon's quakes striking offshore, roughly about 16 kilometers southwest of the area of Malango. Tuesday's other quake off the coast of Batemans Bay in NSW southeast also was shallow. With a depth of just 10 kilometers, it was located offshore and its magnitude of 3. 2 meant it was 1,000 times smaller than the Indonesian quake, Pascal said. Pejic said it was actually the Indo-Australian plate, the one laying under our country, which was causing the stresses along the Sunda Trench and the Solomons Trench, given the fact it remains one of the world's fastest moving tectonic plates. But you get different movement on the Sunda Trench to the Solomons Trench, they're not the same, she said. The Indonesian quake and the Solomons quake have nothing to do with each other. So are we getting more quakes than normal? To put it bluntly, no, according to both Pascal and Pejic. The frequency of this week's incidents could be seen as a little bit unusual, not unheard of, Pascal said. Instead it was more a reflection of technological advancements and heightened emergency communication networks which largely meant people were able to find out about seismic events almost as they happened, he said. The type of quakes occurring along the Sunda plate at magnitude 5 or greater, like that which hit West Java on Monday, are being recorded daily, Pejic said. 5 for Java is a moderate magnitude earthquake, that's pretty common. 6 or 7 above we call large earthquakes, in purely seismic terms for the area, what occurred along the Sunda trench this week was what Pejic described as, business as usual. The feeling that I'm having now is we have the Java event, then the Solomon Islands event, this is where it gets picked out online, Pejic said. There's a sense there's much more going on that is unusual, that's not correct. Pascal largely agreed, there's a trend of people thinking there's more quakes but it's more a case of people finding out about them much quicker. These things can happen in clusters. There is no pattern. That's why there's no method for earthquake prediction. All we can do is prepare and educate. So why has Australia escaped big quake consequences? To be clear, Australia has experienced major earthquakes, some even greater than the deadly 1989 Newcastle event. But it appears most of them have been in relatively unpopulated areas. Geoscience Australia currently puts the country's largest recorded earthquake at Tennant Creek in the Northern Territory, where it struck with an estimated magnitude of 6. 6 in 1988, fortunately it hit in a sparsely populated area, only resulting in damage to a major gas pipeline. A magnitude 6.5 earthquake at Meckering in Western Australia in 1968 caused extensive damage to buildings and was felt over most of southern Western Australia. It left a rupture 40 kilometers long with 60 to 70 houses destroyed, Pejic said. She also noted a 6.6 .6 magnitude quake in 2019 which struck offshore near Broome. If that had been underneath Broome, it would have been obliterated, she said. 
But our positioning in the center of the Indo-Australian plate could be one explanation why we are definitely not experiencing the same kind of quakes as countries such as Indonesia, which are on top of or near the edges of plates in the ring of fire. Geoscience Australia says that in the relatively stable interior of continents, away from plate boundaries, earthquakes are less common and do not follow easily recognizable patterns. These intraplate earthquakes generally originate at shallow depths, less than 20 kilometers, but can still be of large magnitude. We're in the middle of a plate. Seismicity is a bit more diffused, she said. Maybe we have fewer quakes but we absolutely do get them, but subduction zones, along the edges, have the ability to make the largest quakes.